Greetings, economic students. So today we're going to be in chapter 27, chapter 27 of your textbook. Uh, and the first thing in there I'm going to talk about is on page 645 of the book in the second edition. And this chapter is on money and banking. Now, the, the book actually starts off its chapter with an interesting little story about cowrie shells. These are seashells. And they were found, these cowries, beautiful little shells found on the Maldive Islands off the southern coast of India, in the Indian Ocean. But people began about 1,500 years ago to use these cowrie shells for money. And they spread as money all around the Indian Ocean, down the east coast of Africa, down the coast of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, India itself, inland into Africa, and even into China, people did take cowrie shells as money. In fact, there were still some places in Africa where people were using cowrie shells as money in the 1900s. So that's pretty remarkable. And it raises a question about what is money. But you know me being a historian, I've got to give you a little history lesson thrown in. Did you know the very first money in the world, real money that was created as money, coins, was coined about 650 BC on the south coast of Asia. Asia Minor, sorry, Asia Minor. The country that's today Turkey it was in the country called Lydia that they first made coins. But that means all of the ancient Egyptian civilization you've ever studied, the pyramids, Tutankhamun's tomb, all that was made in a world with no money at all. The great civilizations of Egypt, Sumer, the Indus River Valley, northern China, all of them arose without one thin dime among them. No money. So what did they use to run their economies? They've always got elaborate civilizations. How did they do it? Barter, which is, of course, the exchange of a good or service for another good or service. If I'm a shoemaker and I want a haircut, I give the barber a pair of shoes for my haircut. You can do this. It does work. It's better if you've got something like, say, a bag of grain to barter, since everybody can use food and grain keeps pretty well. But even then, you're still got to have a, a donkey with grain on his back to go buy something. It's not at all convenient. And part of what will give birth to money is simple convenience. And if you're talking about shoes, let's say you want a service, but you think, man, it's not worth, one haircut's not worth a pair of my shoes. It takes me five hours to make these shoes. It takes him 20 minutes to cut my hair. So then you have to start saying, well, tell what, give me five haircuts in exchange for this pair of shoes. And you can see how you get all kinds of arguments and things that just don't divide up easily. How do you barter them? It's a mess. Money solves a lot of those problems. Um, moving ahead in the book, it points out the functions of money. What does money do that takes care of some of these barter problems? Well, money is a medium of exchange. The word medium means thing in the middle. It's like the medium shirt some of you get to wear is in the middle between a small and a large, right? Medium means a thing in the middle. So money is a thing in the middle between two people to exchange. It's because each of them have a want for the money. The money will do both of them good. So they, it is a way they can exchange services among them. They both like the money. So nobody, very few people are going to say, oh no, don't give me that. That's just money. Might be some circumstances, but not very many. Uh, as mediums of exchange between people, money does the job great. Money is also a store of a value, a store of value. Let's say you were a vegetable seller in ancient Egypt and you have a basket full of leeks that you grew. The store value of those leeks is probably going to be about a week and they will be a rotten mess much beyond that, right? They don't store value at all well. That valuable bag of basket of leeks today in a week is garbage of no use to anybody but is fertilizer for the ground again, especially in a world with no refrigeration. 
So money is a store of value. A, a certain amount of silver in a coin is going to have that same value or close to it a long time from now. Now, there can be a problem with storing value in money. Inflation is a degradation of the value of money, right? If I have a dollar bill today and we're running at 5% inflation per year, next year my dollars, dollar will only buy me 95 cents worth of stuff. And the year after that, what, 91 cents worth of stuff. And the year after that, it bleeds down into the 80s, right? So, um, you know, as an inflation does eat away at the value of money. But at least it's bound to last under most normal circumstances, months without too much loss. And in our modern American economy, we're talking usually 2 or 3% inflation rates. So money holds value pretty well, even today. And that's, you know, if it was silver and gold coins, like in the old days, it probably hold money much, much better than that. Money is also a unit of account. It's a way of keeping track. Like I said, if you're bartering shoes for haircuts, how exactly do you sort out how many haircuts you get for a pair of shoes? Well, money helps to foster that. It, it makes it easier to keep track of the relative value of things because it is a unit of account. It tells us what the relative value of things is in the market. Uh, it is also a standard of deferred payment. Um, I can promise to pay you in the future a certain amount of money and you will know what you will get then. If I promise to give you, you know, a pair of shoes a year from now, those shoes don't even exist right now, probably. So I'm promising you something that doesn't even exist. The money could be sitting in a bag under my bed right now. So it is a way of deferring payment into the future that everybody can agree on. All right. Uh, so these are the basic things that money is a great advance over barter as a system. Now, what kind of money exists? The basic kind of money that was first invented, well, those coins I was telling you about in 650 BC, and what most people around the world used for money until about 350 years ago, is what is called commodity money. In other words, the money is made out of a thing that itself is valuable. Silver, gold, copper, nickel. These are metals that are inherently valuable. You can use silver and gold for jewelry or electronics uh, or, you know, jewelry because it's just pretty, right? Um, but, but they're useful things in and of themselves. The commodity is one people want. The money is what the, the commodity is made out of. The money is made out of that commodity and its value is determined by the commodity. If you have a gold coin, the amount of gold determines the value of that coin. That's why the king of Lydia uh, stamped his name and picture on those gold coins he first minted in 650 BC. What he was saying is, I certify, I the king promise you there is this amount of gold in this coin. You don't have to worry, I promise there's that much gold there. Which tells you exactly how valuable the coin is. So the governments, what they were doing when they minted coins was guaranteeing this is a shekel's worth of silver. This is a, uh, a solidus worth of gold. That's what they certified. Now, you can have inflation even in the commodity coin uh, situation if people debase the metals. If instead of pure gold, you put some other metal in there. Maybe the same size as it was before, but it's not pure gold anymore, so it's worth less. You need to have, once people realize it's worth less, they're going to demand more of those coins uh, to sell you something with them. And that means inflation. So like the ancient Roman Empire had terrible inflation uh, during the 300s and 400s AD because of debased metal in the coins. All right. So you've got commodity money. That's money actually made out of a commodity that's valuable in and of itself. You have commodity-backed money. 
And this is what, say, a dollar bill was until 1957. If you've ever seen an old bill, look at the top of it above George Washington's head. It'll say United States Silver Certificate. What that meant was you could take that dollar bill into a bank and they would give you $1 worth of silver for that paper money. The paper money was backed by the commodity silver. A silver dollar was a dollar's worth of silver in the old days. And you could take your paper money in there, they'd give you a real silver dollar coin made out of silver, 90% silver, 10% copper, uh, that, that you could have as a commodity. But that's not how our money is now. If you take out a dollar bill, and I know we talked about this, it says on there, nothing about silver. What it says is, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. This is what's called fiat money. Fiat is the Latin phrase that means, let it be so. Why is this linen thing in my hand worth a dollar? Because the United States government says it is. That's all there is to it. And it's only worth the trust you put in that government. In 1865, in January of 1865, if you had a $100 Confederate bill, you probably couldn't buy lunch with it. Because those Confederate dollars were fiat money of the Confederate States of America. And by January 1865, most people assumed there wouldn't be any Confederate States of America around in six more months. And they were right. As soon as the Confederacy ceased to exist, its money became scrap paper. There was no silver behind it you could redeem it for. Nothing but the word of a government that doesn't exist anymore. So this is fiat money. It's a dollar because it's worth a dollar because the U.S. government says it's worth a dollar. Let it be so. Fiat. All right. Measuring money. Now, first off, the word currency. This is currency. Paper dollars are currency. Metal discs money, that's coins. Coins and currency. Currency is the paper dollars. But money is more than that, right? And the Federal Reserve System has categories for money that you need to know. The first one is M1. M1 money. And the M1 money supply is the most liquid money. Now, a dollar bill is perfectly liquid. I can walk into the 7-Eleven and buy a dollar's worth of stuff with my dollar instantly. This is a dollar, <laughs> all right? I don't need to change it into dollars. It is a dollar. It's perfectly liquid. So that is part of M1. The highly liquid money in the world is M1 money supply. Currency. Also, though, deposit accounts like a checking account. The money's in the bank, and I can access it with a debit card instantly. I can write a check and hand it to you, and you can walk in the bank and get your money instantly. Checking accounts are M1 money supply because they are also perfectly liquid. Within three days, at least, you're getting your money. Traveler's checks. I don't think you really have to worry much about traveler's checks anymore. It's a tiny amount of the money out in the world. They do still exist. What they what they were, well, what they are, is if you're traveling overseas, you could get traveler's checks. You pay the bank money, they give you traveler's checks. And until you signed that paper form, it wasn't worth anything. But the moment you signed the form and gave it to the clerk in the store, it was exactly the same as dollar bills to the clerk in the store. The advantage of traveler's checks was if somebody stole your wallet while you're traveling, you got your money back unless you'd sign the darn things. They couldn't turn in a fake signature and get money for them, so the banks would give you your money back. It was a way of insuring yourself against theft while traveling. But those are rare now. So the M1 money supply is essentially currency and checking accounts. M2 is somewhat less liquid money. It is M1 and it's all the cash in the checking accounts, but it's beyond that, the somewhat less uh, liquid money, savings accounts. Now, those are deposit accounts, but remember, you're getting that interest because the bank puts limits on how you can get at it. 
you don't have the ability to go in and just keep taking money out of a savings account. Usually the bank will slam you with a fine, a fee of some kind, or maybe even close down your account if you try to take out of a savings account more than, say, three times a month. They want your money to stay put because they're paying you interest. So it's less liquid. You might have to wait a month before you can get it. Another part of the M2 supply that is certainly less liquid are time deposits. Certificates of deposits are money I pay in usually pretty large amounts, thousands of dollars to a bank. They give me a higher interest on a reg than on a regular savings account, but I can't touch that money for six months or a year or five years. Usually a five-year CD, you'd have to have like $50,000 in the bank for five years. They give, it, you, they give you a five-year CD, certificate of deposit. They give you a better interest rate than you could get in other accounts with them if you do that. But you're surrendering control of your money for five years. You can't get out unless you pay a big penalty. So that's M2 money supply. And the other M2 money supply is money market accounts. This is where people can pool their resources. Say you got a cash settlement on a lawsuit or something. You got $200,000 cash. You might take 100,000 of that and put it in a money market account. And that's where all kinds of people are pooling their money in a fund managed by a professional who then takes that money and invests it in conservative government bonds. And you get an interest off the government bonds. You get a share of the pool of money's interest every quarter every month or something. Uh, that's a money market account. All those things together, the M1 money supply and the M2 uh, extra stuff is M2. Okay. So that's the total amount of money that's in an economy. And actually in your book on page 650, it gives you the, uh, the figures there in 2000, was that 2015? Um, there were $1,271.8 billion in currency, paper money. That's in people's pockets and in bank vaults. Traveler's checks are only $2.9 billion. That's pocket change compared, right? Uh, and then demand deposits and other checking accounts. So that's essentially checking accounts. That's a demand deposit. When you look at a check, when you write the name on there, the person you're writing the check to, it says, pay to the order of blank so many dollars. You're saying to the bank, I demand you give John Doe $5. So it's a demand account. You can get it anytime you want. They can't tell you you can't get your money in a checking account because it's a demand account. Uh, so demand accounts like checking accounts, $1,713.5 billion. Uh, the M2 money, so that was a total of just shy of $3 trillion in the M1 money supply back then. But then look at savings accounts, $7,712,000,000,000 in savings accounts. People are putting it there because they want to get interest, right? They want money to work for them. So they want to surrender some liquidity to get interest income. And so that's, a, that's more than double the M1 money supply just in savings accounts. Uh, then time deposits, that would be uh, CDs. That would be those CDs, certificates of deposit I was talking about. And then individual money market fund balances. So $509 billion in CDs, essentially, and $610 billion in money market. So grand total, $11,800,000,000,000 in our economy in 2015. That's a lot of money. Okay. Um, that's 19 minutes. I'm going to stop there, but the next lecture will finish talking about money. Thank you.